three are counseling master's students at the University of Central Oklahoma. And my name is Dia Abbott. I'm Adam Everson. And I'm Sarah Pagero. And today we're going to talk to you about coping cat for anxiety disorders. So when to use coping cat? Well, coping cat is an intervention developed for children and young adolescents with anxiety. What do we mean by that age range? Typically seven to 12 years old. However, there is another program for older children developed by the same creators of Coping Cat called the CAT Project or the CAT Project. Uh, and that is for children and well, for really adolescents age 12 to 17. So if you do have a 12 year old that you're considering for Coping Cat, you might also um, decide whether developmentally it would be better for them to do Coping Cat or the CAT Project. When we say with anxiety, that's pretty broad. Usually, most of the research has been on children and young adolescents with um, generalized anxiety disorder, or selective mutism, or social anxiety disorder, or a mixture of those. Um, there is some differences in these diagnoses for children versus adults. For generalized anxiety disorder, um, in the DSM-5, criteria A and B are the same as with adults, but criterion C is different. With adults, it says anxiety and worry are associated with three or more of the following six symptoms. But for children, you only need one of those six symptoms. So either restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge, or being easily fatigued, or difficulty concentrating or mind going blank, or irritability, or muscle tension, or sleep disturbance. So you only need one. Um, and then the criteria D through F are also the same as with adults. So it needs to be distressing or impairing. Um, there does need to be worry that cannot be controlled, but generally it's the same as with adults other than that one difference in the diagnostic criteria. Now, there is a lower prevalence of children with GAD than there is of adults with GAD. Um, there is about a 0.9% prevalence in the United States for adolescents with GAD, as opposed to almost 3% for adults. And the average age of onset is 30 years old, but there's a really wide range of age of onset. And it is relatively rare prior to adolescence. Uh, Caucasians are more likely to develop generalized anxiety disorder than people of other racial and ethnic backgrounds. Children with, and adolescents with GAD tend to have their worry more focused on school performance or competence or sporting events and their competence and performance in those areas. And that's true whether or not they're being evaluated by others in those areas. Uh, another common area of worry would be with catastrophes or disasters. Um, so a lot of worry about tornadoes or earthquake or a fire, just the worst case scenario happening is pretty common. And perfectionism is also a common trait in children with GAD and adolescents with GAD. Um, just a really a fixation on needing everything to be done just right. I need to do everything perfectly. Um, along with that punctuality, needing that perfect attendance award, needing that um, to be on time is also a source of worry for some children or adolescents with GAD. And they also tend to seek excessive reassurance and approval um, seeking. So I will go over all of the diagnostic criteria for selected mutism because that does tend to be a diagnosis primarily for children. Um, it is a consistent failure to speak in social situations where there is an expectation to do so, like at school, despite speaking in other situations. So they need to be speaking, maybe at home with very close family or friends, but not elsewhere, not in other public situations. The disturbance need to interfere with educational, or occupational, or social achievement and communication. It needs to last at least one month, but it's very important that that is not just the first month of school. Some kids are more slow to warm up, and it takes time for them to feel comfortable in a new class environment. 
the failure to speak is not attributable to knowledge of or comfort with a specific spoken language. So if English is not their first language and they're in an English speaking school and they're not talking there, but when they're at home and they're speaking Spanish, they're completely comfortable. And when they go in and visit extended family or they go um, back to their family's country of origin and they are interacting with like vendors and things like that, they don't have a problem, then you wouldn't diagnose with social anxiety, with selective mutism. Um, so um, if English is not the child's first language, then you would need to make sure that that choice, that need to not speak is also true in their first language. So if they're not speaking at an English speaking school, um, but at home they speak Spanish, and when they go to neighborhoods and vendors that speak Spanish, they have no problem in those environments, you would not diagnose with social anxiety disorder. But if also, when they're speaking their native tongue, if that's Spanish in the situation, they have social environments in which they feel that they cannot speak and they do not speak, then you could go ahead and diagnose with selective mutism because it happens across languages. Um, and the disturbance needs to not be better explained by a communication disorder or exclusively in the course of autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, or another psychotic disorder. Um, there is a much lower prevalence of selective mutism than for, say, GAD. They think maybe 0.03% might be kind of on the lower end. Some studies have so shown a 1% prevalence, but those are in very clinical populations. And selective mutism is more likely to manifest in young children than it is to, an adolescent, to occur in adolescence. And the average age of onset is five years old. Social anxiety disorder, um, the criteria is a little bit different for children than for adults, but much of it is very much the same. So that marked fear or anxiety in one or more social situations um, in which there's a fear of possible scrutiny by others. Now for children, it's really important to know that the anxiety has to occur in peer groups and not just with adults. Uh, some children are anxious around adults and feel that they may be judged by adults, but are comfortable with their peer group. And that would not receive a social anxiety diagnosis. But if with their peers, in addition to with adults, they feel that way, then they may qualify for the diagnosis of social anxiety disorder. Um, they need to fear that they'll act in a way that would show anxiety symptoms um, or act in a way that would be negatively evaluated. And the social situations almost always provoke fear or anxiety. Now with children, they may show with that fear and anxiety in a little bit different way than adults. Um, adults are better able to control their environment and that they can avoid social situations, whereas children may not have that opportunity. So in children, the fear and anxiety might be expressed by crying or tantrums or freezing or clinging, shriek shrinking back um, or just failing to speak in social situations. So there is a pretty high overlap between selective mutism and social anxiety disorder, um, which you may see in your population that you're working with. And then the rest of the criteria D through J are the same as it is with adults for social anxiety disorder. Now um, the median age of onset for social anxiety disorder is 13 years that's in the US. And over about 75% have an onset between eight years old and 15 years old. Um, so it would be more common for you to see this population in your clinic. And um, social anxiety disorder is very heritable. Um, relatives, first degree, if you have a first degree relative with social anxiety disorder, you have a two to six times more likely chance of developing social anxiety disorder. Um, and there is some herit heritability overlap with selective mutism. So children that have a relative with social anxiety disorder are also a little bit more likely to develop selective mutism. There seems to be some overlap there. Um, the 12 month prevalence is 0.5 
to maybe up to 2%, which is true for adults and for children. And there are more males than females that have diagnosed social anxiety disorder, which may be as high as a 2 to 1 ratio. <clears throat> children and adolescents with social anxiety disorder tend to have um, social inhibition early on before they are diagnosable. So we tend to see that mm, going back in your family history, you actually were had a lot of social inhibition at a young age and this slowly developed over time. Um, the onset of when social anxiety disorder is diagnosable may be associated with a stressor um, like bullying or another life stressor in which they feel scrutinized. And adolescents tend to endorse a broader pattern of avoidance than children do. And that tends to include dating. Now that we've gone over some common anxiety disorders and what that looks like in children, let's go over the basics of the Coping Cat treatment program. The goal of Coping Cat is to teach children to recognize signs of anxious arousal and to implement strategies to better cope with anxiety-provoking situations. Coping Cat is a CBT approach to anxiety, so it uses both behavioral and cognitive approaches to dealing with the anxiety. In terms of success rates, 50 to 72 percent of children diagnosed with an anxiety disorder no longer meet criteria for that disorder following treatment. The Coping Cat program has an overarching story about a um, cat who uh, learns to cope. Um, and this happens across 16 weeks. So in the first part, the child learns skill acquisition. This involves a lot of psychoeducation and teaching the child ways to deal with anxiety. The second part of treatment involves skill practice, where the child uses the skills taught in the first part in exposure tasks. There are also two parent sessions in treatment. These are meant to inform the parents about what's going on in treatment and allow them to bring up any questions or concerns they have about treatment. In the Coping Cat program, the therapist and child work together to develop a fear plan. This is a plan that the child can use to cope with anxiety. The first letter, F, stands for feeling frightened. This is meant to help the child identify any anxious feelings or physical sensations that are associated with anxiety. The second letter, E, stands for expecting bad things to happen. This helps the child identify any thoughts or beliefs that are contributing to their anxiety. A stands for attitudes and actions that can help. This prompts the child to engage in problem solving or alternative ways of handling anxiety provoking situations. And finally, R stands for results and rewards. This helps the child realistically evaluate his or her coping efforts and how to reward oneself for efforts to cope with anxiety. There are also some coping cat treatments that use computer programs to help with the psychoeducation, and researchers are finding promising results with these programs. Some advantages of these programs are that it reduces the cost of services and makes treatment more mobile. However, there are some noted disadvantages, such as the loss of the therapeutic alliance and limiting how individualized treatment can be. Researchers are finding, though, that the best way to use computer programs is to split treatment between the computerized program and treatment face-to-face -face with a therapist. A lot of children deal with anxiety, and sometimes anxiety doesn't just present itself alone. Sometimes there's a comorbid situation going on, and this can complicate treatment sometimes. So let's go over a few of those comorbid situations. First, let's talk about autism spectrum disorder. Up to 84% of individuals who qualify for an autism diagnosis do experience clinically significant levels of anxiety and that individuals with autism are at a greater risk for anxiety, so this makes sense. However, until recently, there has been a lack of CBT-based interventions for autism, 
a lot of people assumed that children with autism lacked the ability to identify and understand emotions and cognitions in themselves or others, a concept known as the theory of mind. However, recent research suggests that the theory of mind insight is moderated by many factors, including age and intellectual ability. So, some children with an autism diagnosis can still comprehend theory of mind. Coping Cat has been used with children with autism, and research has shown that 53 to 70 percent of children who complete the Coping Cat program no longer qualify for an anxiety diagnosis, even though they qualify for an autism diagnosis. However, some notable changes need to be made to treatment when working with a child with autism, such as lengthening sessions or using more concrete language. 32% of children who meet the diagnostic criteria for an anxiety disorder also meet the criteria for ADHD. So when you're working with these kids, you do need to make some treatment changes. Those could be delivering treatment uh, in shorter intervals, but having more breaks, or making the content of treatment more interactive. When it comes to depression or depressive symptomologies, there can be some diagnostic complications with children. There's a great deal of symptomology overlap with anxiety and depression in children, such as irritability, agitation, or restlessness. Some things you can look for are fear and sadness. If it's fear, the child is likely more experiencing anxiety. If it's sadness, the child is likely experiencing more depression. Another thing you can look for are that anxious children tend to still have a strong capacity for joy, whereas depressed children tend to feel more feelings of helplessness. So if you're working with a child who's experiencing anxiety and depression, there are some special considerations you should use for treatment, such as noting any negative cognitions regarding themes of failure, personal loss, or negative foreshadowing, and if necessary, slowing down the progress of treatment in order to build rapport and create a stronger therapeutic alliance. Anxiety can also have obsessive features, which may look more like OCD. So it can be difficult to decipher between what is an obsessive feature and what is common of things like generalized anxiety disorder, which may have perfectionism. A good way to tell is that with obsessive features, the child is obsessed with a process and has rituals that are associated with it. Whereas with perfectionism, the child is more anxious about things that would be a reflection of himself or herself. If you're working with a child who has obsessive features, make sure exposures directly address these obsessions. Also, children with obsessive patterns may be more resistant to treatment as their rituals are in place to reduce their anxiety. When it comes to working with a child who experiences panic, there can be some diagnostic complications with giving the child panic disorder or a specifier of with panic attacks. Some argue that children do not have the cognitive capacity of making internal attributions of their symptoms, which is a diagnostic criterion for a panic attack or panic disorder. However, there are still some special considerations when working with a child who experiences panic. First, utilize muscle relaxation over breathing techniques. Breathing may exacerbate hyperventilation, which may encourage the onset of panic. Also, address the parent's reaction to a child's panic attacks and how that may be influencing the situation. Depending on the age of the child, treatment may need to be adapted. For younger children, consider increasing parent involvement and consider the child's ability to comprehend the material. With adolescents, acknowledge and validate concerns that the material may be too babyish. There is a version of Coping Cat called the CAT Project that may be more appropriate. Also present the material as an experiment. Tell the child that you can try it for one or two sessions, and if it doesn't work, you'll find something new. If a child is also experiencing social skills deficits or social anxiety, you can make certain program changes for both Part 1 and Part 2 of treatment. With skill acquisition, incorporate the clinic staff in the psychoeducation process. Have the child go around and ask staff members how they experience anxiety physically. Also, help the child distinguish between realistic and unrealistic fears. Some social fears could be very realistic. In terms of skill practice, exposures should be graded in terms of both fear level and social complexity. 
Also, help the child practice coping with negative interpersonal outcomes by doing it with them in the session. When working with children who have anxiety, you may encounter some complicating factors. One of these complicating factors is problems with compliance. This can be over-compliance or it can be not complying at all. In the case of over-compliance, this child is eager to please. They don't want to ask questions. They don't want to tell you that they don't understand anything. One way to combat this is to tell the child to teach it back to you. If the child doesn't understand and they can't teach it back to you, that's when you let them know that it's okay to ask you for questions if they don't understand something. In the case of a non-complying child, ask them what their behavior represents. If the child is telling you that they're bored in session, that's possibly because they don't want to discuss their feelings because their feelings are upsetting to them. And with this child, it's important to be patient and to continue building rapport. Another complicating factor is hypercriticism. For this child, anything less than perfect is failure. So this child wants to please everyone and they'll do their assignments perfectly. If the child makes any single mistake, then they want to start over and they feel horrible about it. For this child, sometimes their hypercriticism is observed by their parent and that's where they learned it from. And if this is the case, then you have to ask the parent to be aware of their own hypercriticism. Another complicating factor that you may encounter is school refusal. When you encounter this problem, you're going to have to work with not only the child, but also the parent and the personnel of the school. Anxious children may refuse to go to school, or sometimes they go to school, but they frequently get sent home. These children are typically experiencing both separation anxiety and anxiety about a particular situation in the school. Both problems need to be addressed in this situation. In early sessions, you want to learn about any type of school difficulties that the child is experiencing. Does the child have any friends? Is there a teacher that the child is afraid of? Or maybe the child's being bullied and that's why they don't want to go to school. It's also important to address the child's strengths and the child's resources. Is there a teacher or a counselor that the child feels safe with when they are at school? Are there friends in the same class that they are that they can sit next to or that they can use as a resource? Also, creating a school survival pack may also be of assistance. You can add in this pack some stickers, some positive notes, some positive thoughts. And another thing is to have a safe place for the child to go whenever they do get overstimulated at school. This could be a spot in the hallway, they may go to the bathroom, it may be a place in the classroom as well. When working with the parents of school avoidant children, you have to explore difficulties that are occurring at, at the home or in the neighborhood. In the home, it may be alcoholism or abuse. In the neighborhood, there may be a lot of neighborhood crime, things like that. After you discuss possible parent problems, then you have to discuss how these problems might interfere with treatment and then discuss some, problems, some ways to fix it. So this may be referring the parent for individual therapy, not only the child. You also want to find out more information about the avoidance behavior from the parent. When does a child begin protesting? Does it begin the night before? Does it begin the morning of? Or does it begin whenever they get to school? At what point does the parent concede to the protesting? Which parent responds first? And how does the parent respond? Do the parents work together or do they work against each other? These questions, they help us plan for possible failures in the future. You also want to prepare the parent for distress. The child is going to cry, it's probably going to kick and scream. You have to prepare the parent that these are normal reactions to the behavior that's happening. And you also have to explain to the parent how important rewards are for success. Also, you have to work with school personnel. You have to find out if any of the faculty at school are involved in the avoidance behavior. For example, the child may be complaining of a stomach ache and goes to the school nurse and the nurse sends them home. Or maybe they complain of a headache and the nurse sends them home. You also need to work with the teachers to find out if there's a possible buddy that may be linked with the child to make them feel more comfortable when they are at school. Another complicating factor are realistic fears and they aren't just anxiety. Children from lower socioeconomic groups have been found to have more realistic fears about specific events. For example, a child might have a lot of anxiety about possibly being stabbed and it's because she saw other children get stabbed during street fights and things like that. So we have to, it's important to distinguish between a realistic fear and an anxious thought. Another complicating factor is 
family difficulties. These can be parents who are overprotective or parents who set inappropriate limits with their child. It's important that when you do notice these behaviors and you bring it up to the parent, that you're making sure that the parent doesn't feel criticized or blamed for that. Marital problems and substance abuse can also be a complicating factor in family difficulties because it results in the parent being less motivated. If the parent isn't motivated, then the child most likely won't be motivated at all. Now that we've looked at the diagnostic criteria for common anxiety disorders, the basics of coping cat, and how to address comorbidity and other complicating factors, let's look at the coping cat program session by session. The purpose of session one is to explain the basics of treatment and find out more information about your client. If the child is comfortable, they may even disclose some situations that make them anxious and how they respond to this anxiety. It's also really important to cover confidentiality in this session since you will be working with minors and their parents. Try to make this first session fun, but also make sure that you're going with the flow. The personal facts game worksheet that's included in the workbook, it's a really good icebreaker for this session. At the end of the session, you'll want to introduce the child's first homework assignment. We call it a show that I can, or stick for short. Every stick that the child brings back earns him two points, or stickers, depending on the child's preference. These go into the bank and can be spent on rewards that are listed on the rewards menu. Both child and parent come up with rewards together. And remember, rewards do not have to be monetary. Rewards, for example, can be just 10 min and uninterrupted minutes of mom and dad time. The purpose of session two is to identify anxious feelings and introduce the concept that different feelings have different physical expressions. For example, your heart may race if you just ran to class, or it may race if you're anxious because you have a presentation that you have in that class. In this session, we begin to construct a hierarchy of anxious provoking situations. Make sure to review the child's stick from last week and reward any effort at all, even if the child didn't complete the entire worksheet. The stick for this session is to write about a situation when you were feeling relaxed and write about a situation about when you were feeling anxious. The purpose of session three is to help the child learn their specific somatic responses to anxiety. And we do this by first reviewing the difference between anxious feelings and other feelings and then helping the child identify their own physiological responses to anxiety. The goals of session three are first to review the homework from session two. If the child didn't complete the homework, that's okay, go over it with them in this session. The second goal is to discuss general reactions to anxiety like butterflies in your stomach or your heart racing. Then the third goal is to help the child identify his or her own specific reactions to anxiety. A good way to do this is to introduce a feelings thermometer to help the child better understand his or her anxious feelings and also to provide a chart of the body and where anxiety can be felt, like in the head with headaches or in the legs with a restless leg. Session three also introduces the fear plan by introducing the letter F for feeling frightened. When the child is feeling anxious, he should ask himself, am I feeling afraid and how does my body feel right now? Another good thing to discuss in session three is the upcoming meeting with the parents. Talk to the child about what this will entail and reassure the child that no personal information will be shared. And finally, assign homework for the next week. Two times over the next week, the child is to record his or her body's reactions to anxiety and rate it on a feelings thermometer. Session four is the first meeting with the parents. The purpose of this session is to encourage parents to get involved in the treatment and also answer any general questions the parents may have about the treatment. The goals of session four are to first provide information about treatment to the parents. Treatment is not about eliminating the child's anxiety, it is teaching the child to manage his or her anxiety. Second, provide the parents an opportunity to discuss their concerns. This is a good time to understand how the parents understand anxiety and how they feel it should be managed. Third, learn more about the situations in which the child becomes nervous. This can give you more insight into the child's anxiety and how the parents perceive it. And finally, offer ways that the parents can get involved in treatment. For example, coming to session five to learn about relaxation skills or teaching the parents about the dangers of avoiding anxiety. Session five focuses on relaxation training. 
So the purpose of the session is to review how to recognize the somatic cues that indicate the child's tense and anxious, and to introduce relaxation training and use it in controlling the tension associated with the, that anxiety. And you do that through, first, you would acknowledge the parent session that it existed and what the child thinks about that. Um, then you would go ahead and review the stick task from session three and introduce the idea that many somatic feelings are associated with anxiety and that they involve that muscle tension. So then you would introduce the idea of relaxation. You would introduce the techniques. You would say, imagine feeling relaxed, imagine feeling tense, and then compare that um, feeling of relaxed versus being tense. And the metaphor that they use in that is feeling like a robot or a rag doll. It's a really good description of what it's like to feel super tense and rigid like a robot versus loose like a rag doll. It talks about the different muscles of the body and what it's like for each of them to feel tense versus each of them feeling relaxed. Then you would um, introduce a few of those techniques, so maybe deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and give them other um, materials to help them with relaxing and aids for relaxation as needed. You want to develop the child's awareness of how and when relaxation might be useful and practice relaxation with a role play and with modeling. Then you would um, practice relaxation with the parents so that the parents are accustomed to what you're doing in session. And you would assign the task, the stick task, which is practice relaxation for at least once a day for several days and write about two anxiety provoking situations and include any thoughts or somatic cues that the client feels related to that anxiety. In session six, you identify anxious self-talk and learn to challenge those thoughts. So we're introducing the fundamentals of cognitive restructuring. So you would introduce the function of personal thoughts and their impact on how we respond to anxiety provoking situations. And you would help the child recognize his own self-talk, their expectations, automatic questions, attributions, and anxiety situations. Um, you'd help them develop and build their repertoire of coping self-talk and review relaxation training that you had done in session five. So you start the session with the review and then you introduce the concept of self-talk, of thoughts, thoughts are self-talk. Um, you discuss self-talk and anxiety provoking situations and then you differentiate that anxious self-talk from coping self-talk, which is essentially introducing the E step in the fear plan. So expecting bad things to happen and how our self-talk and identifying those thoughts and beliefs contribute to um, building anxiety. And then you practice coping self-talk once you've shown the differentiation and you've shown that anxious self-talk can build anxiety, whereas coping self-talk might help you out, you practice what coping self-talk is and then you assign the stick task, which is essentially a worry diary. The purpose of session 7 is to review the concepts of anxious self-talk and how to reframe that anxious self-talk into positive coping self-talk. We also introduce the concept of problem solving and how to use problem solving strategies to manage anxiety. We want to review the F and E steps of the fear plan, which as a reminder are feeling frightened and expect bad things to happen. We're also going to introduce the A step, which is attitudes and actions can help. To go over the A step, the child will list a problem and then three possible things that the child can do to make the problem less fearful. Again, you're going to assign an, a stick task for next time. The stick task this time is similar to the one from last session, except this time the A step is included. The purpose of session 8 is to introduce the R step in the fear plan, which is results and rewards. You can describe rewards to the child like a puppy learning a new trick. If the puppy sits for you once, then you give the puppy treats or cuddles as a reward, but the puppy doesn't necessarily learn the trick immediately. 
the puppy takes time, trial, and error before he masters the trick. Emphasize that little personal rewards such as bubble baths, reading a book, or even telling yourself that you did a good job are also important. You also have to emphasize effort. Rewards aren't just for perfect jobs. In session 8, we also introduce the feelings barometer. This is like a feelings chart where the child can pinpoint how different situations make them feel. The stick test for this week is to write down two times where you felt anxious or scared and you used the fear. Session 9 is a second meeting with the parents and the purpose of this is just to check in with the parents again and give them an opportunity to ask more questions or to discuss their concerns that they've had with treatment. The goals of Session 9 are to first provide information about this second half of treatment. In this portion of the treatment you will be doing exposure tasks. So the child will actively be using the coping skills he or she has learned. You should also stress the importance of doing homework in this next portion of treatment. Second, go over with the parents any concerns that they may have. Putting a child in an anxious situation can be very anxiety provoking for the parent as well, so talk to them about that. Session 9 is also a good time to talk about situations in which the child becomes anxious with the parents. This can help you plan your exposure task in later sessions. And then also offer specific ways the parents can get involved, like helping you execute a exposure task. Sessions 10 through 12 um, focus on starting the exposure planning the exposures, and progressively increasing the anxiety-provoking situation from low to moderate. Um, so the purpose of session 10 is to practice the four-step coping plan, the fear plan, under a low anxiety-provoking condition with both imaginal and in vivo exposure. So first you would review the stick task from session 8. Then you review the idea of progressing from learning new skills to practicing those new skills. You practice an imaginal low exposure, anxiety, low anxiety provoking situation. First you would prepare, then you do the practice in session. Um, then you briefly review relaxation exercises and you plan your next exposure task for session 11. You assign the stick task, and it's the same thing with 11. So you just continue application, 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 practicing these skills that we've been learning to do. Um, so session 11, you review the stick assignment from session 10. You continue practicing the in vivo exposure and low anxiety provoking situations, exactly what you plan to do in session 10. And then you plan the next exposure task. You plan the exposure for the session 12, and then you assign the stick task. Session 12, same thing. You review what happened, uh, you review the stick task from session 11, you practice using marginal exposure in a moderately anxiety provoking situation, so you've moved up that fear hierarchy, that fear ladder. Then you practice in vivo exposure in a moderately anxiety provoking situation, uh, and then you assign the stick task. Session 13, we're going to practice coping skills for situations that invoke moderate levels of anxiety in the child. In this session, the child will pick out a situation that they believe invokes a medium level of anxiety, or they can even pick a higher level if they're comfortable. We're then going to role play the situation in session and then help the child use the fear plan and those positive coping skills to lessen their anxiety. The stick task for this session is to practice their fear plan in two anxious situations between now and next session. In session 14, the child will practice applying coping skills in high anxiety situations. The goals of session 14 are to first go over the homework from session 13. If the child didn't do it, that's okay, go over it with them in this session. And if the child did do it, talk to them about how they coped with their anxiety and how they rewarded themselves. Second, do the exposure tasks. If it helps, use props. Take the child to a specific location that's anxiety provoking. During the exposure, have the child describe his feelings, somatic responses, and any anxious self-talk he may have. 
have the child give a SUDS rating before the exposure, after the exposure, and about every minute during the exposure. And finally, after the exposure, spend a few minutes just practicing those relaxation techniques. Afterwards, plan for session 15, which will be another high anxiety provoking situation. And lastly, assign homework for the next week. Session 15 will be a lot like session 14. It will give the child an opportunity to practice these coping skills in another high anxiety situation. At the start of session 15, go over the homework that was assigned in session 14. If the child didn't do it, use it as part of today's exposures. If the child did do it, talk to the child about how they were able to accomplish this. Talk to them about how they coped and how they rewarded themselves. Then do the exposure task that you set up for session 15. After those are done, plan for the exposure tasks for session 16. This session is also a good time to discuss terminating treatment. Go over with the child everything that the child has accomplished and has learned. Emphasize the progress the child has made over treatment, and also convey your confidence in the child's ability to cope with anxiety. Session 16 is the final session. And in that session you do your final practice of the high anxiety in vivo exposure. You produce a commercial and review and summarize the whole training program, bring closure to the therapeutic relationship, and make plans with the parent for maintaining the new skills and generalizing the skills to other areas. So you start out the session just as you always do, reviewing the stick task from session 15, and then you conduct the final exposure on the high anxiety provoking situation then you have fun producing the commercial. So this is sort of a um, creative experience to process the emotions of the whole um, treatment. You would let them get creative with it, let them express what they got out of therapy and what they would want other people to know if they were trying to explain what therapy did for them. And then you review and summarize the treatment program to bring closure to the therapeutic relationship. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment.